Welcome to Money Smart Lesson Plan number six, Keep It Safe. In Keep It Safe, we will show you the methods for financial preparedness that will help you protect your assets, provide valuable consumer information about your rights, and explain how to spot predatory lending techniques, identify theft, and other financial abuses. Our objectives with Keep It Safe are to provide guidance and instruction about laws and regulations that protect your money and deposits laws and regulations that protect you when you are applying for a loan. Provide the information you need to help guard against predatory lending practices and identity theft. Provide valuable information to help you guard against financial crisis. The financial reforms in the United States that have been enacted recently due to the financial meltdown of 2008 have created some new consumer protections. However, it should be noted that these improvements have also caused banks to have to work more diligently to get a larger share of your income. We caution you to carefully consider all information presented to you by the banking industry and strive to understand it independently before making any banking decisions, as they may prove to be expensive if they are not thought out carefully enough. We will do our best to explain the various facets of the new laws here and how they will affect you. Deposit-Related Federal Consumer Protection Laws and Regulations Truth in Savings Act, TISA The Truth in Savings Act enables consumers to make informed decisions before opening a deposit account. Because of this law, banks must provide account information to consumers when they ask for it. The information needs to be clear and in writing so consumers can use it to shop for the best account. Some of the required information that a bank must give to consumers includes interest rate information, balance requirements, fee information. If a consumer telephones a bank to ask for interest rates on deposit accounts, the bank must state the annual percentage yield, APY, that reflects the effects of compounding. Use the APY when making comparisons among different savings accounts. Electronic Fund Transfer Act EFTA. The Electronic Fund Transfer Act establishes rights, liabilities, and responsibilities of customers who use electronic fund transfer services and the banks that offer these services. Electronic fund transfer services include the use of automated teller machines or ATMs, debit cards, and telephone or computer transactions. EFTA requires financial institutions to limit consumer liability if ATM cards are lost or stolen and protects consumers against electronic transfer errors. Expedited Funds Availability Act EFAA. The Expedited Funds Availability Act limits the amount of time a bank can hold a check deposited into a checking account. FDIC Deposit Insurance Regulations FDIC insurance protects your money if the bank fails. However, the FDIC does not insure non-deposit investment products such as stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and annuities. Non-deposit investment products. Some banks sell non-deposit investment products such as mutual funds, annuities, and stocks. Since these products are not insured by the FDIC, keep the following tips in mind to protect your money. How to protect yourself. Before investing in non-deposit products, have enough emergency money in a savings or other readily accessible account to support you and your family for two to six months. Do not use this money to buy investment products. Never invest in a product you do not understand. Be sure you have enough information before making an investment. Ask questions until you are satisfied. Investments always have some degree of risk. Understand the risks before investing. Be sure your sales representative knows your financial objectives and risk tolerance. Find out more about your registered sales representative or broker-dealer by calling the National Association of Security Dealers, NASD, at 1-800-289-9999 or by visiting www.nasd.com. What lending laws protect you? Before applying for a loan, the Truth in Lending Act, TILA, requires lenders to disclose the total cost of your loan, including the finance charge and the APR. In addition, it gives consumers the right to cancel certain types of home loans within three days. A Truth in Lending disclosure will include the following information. Annual percentage rate, 
the yearly cost of your credit expressed as a percentage. Finance charge, the dollar amount the credit will cost you. Amount financed, the amount of credit provided to you or on your behalf. Total payment, the total amount you will have paid when you have made all scheduled payments. Equal Credit Opportunity Act Before applying for a loan, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, ECOA, protects consumers' rights throughout all stages of the loan process. ECOA promotes the availability of credit to all creditworthy applicants without regard to the factors, also called prohibited basis, listed below. For example, lenders cannot discourage you from applying for a loan or deny your application based on these factors. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, receipt of public assistance income, exercise of rights under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. Example, you cannot be denied a loan because you have filed a complaint against the bank. During the loan application process, ECOA restricts the lender from requesting certain information during the loan application process. In general, the lender may not ask for information about a spouse or former spouse unless your spouse is applying with you. If you are jointly applying or if the loan is secured, the lender may ask your marital status, but may only use the terms married, unmarried, and separated. If you do not qualify on your own, lenders may require a co-signer or guarantor, but may not require that it be your spouse. Please note, if you live in a community property state, a lender may request information concerning your spouse. Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin are community property states, as is Puerto Rico. For income derived from alimony or child support, unless you want it considered as part of your income, the lender cannot discount or refuse to consider consistent part-time income, annuities, pensions, alimony, or child support payments. A lender may not ask about birth control practices or intentions of having children. However, a lender may ask about the number and ages of your dependents, about whether you are male or female. Courtesy titles Mr., Mrs., Ms., or Ms. may be requested, but these are optional. For your race, color, religion, or national origin. Note, in most cases, lenders cannot request the information above. However, for certain home loans, lenders must collect some of the information, race, sex, marital status, and age. The lender must notify you in writing within 30 days of the date of the loan application if you have been approved or denied the loan. If you are denied, the notice will contain the name and address of the lender, the name and address of the federal agency you can contact if you feel you have been discriminated against, either a statement of the specific reasons for denial or a notice that you may request the specific reasons for your denial. Fair Credit Reporting Act During the loan application process, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, FCRA, requires that the lender notify you if you are denied a loan or credit because of information in your credit report. This notice is usually combined with the notice denying the loan or credit. The FCRA notice should contain the name, address, and telephone number of the credit reporting agency that provided the credit report to the lender, a statement that the credit reporting agency did not make the decision to deny your application, a notice of your right to obtain a free copy of your credit report within 60 days of receiving the notice, a notice of your right to dispute the information in your credit report, the Money Smart module, to your credit, covers credit reports and how to correct inaccurate information. Fair Debt Collection Practices Act After you get your loan, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, FDCPA, helps eliminate abusive debt collection practices. Under this law, debt collectors other than your creditor cannot contact you at any unusual time or place. Contact you at work if you have informed them not to call you there. Use threat or violence or other criminal means to harm you or your property. Call you with the intent to annoy, abuse, or harass you. Call you without identifying themselves. Use deceptive or misleading methods to collect debt. If you feel the FDCPA has been violated, contact the appropriate federal regulatory agency. These agencies are listed in this participant guide under resource list. 
Fair Credit Billing Act. After you get your loan, the Fair Credit Billing Act, FCBA, requires creditors to promptly credit payments and correct billing mistakes for open-ended accounts such as credit cards. It allows you to withhold payments on defective goods. Note, the Electronic Fund Transfer Act and the Truth in Lending Act also have methods for correcting billing errors. Examples of billing errors include a charge for something you did not buy, a charge that is different from the actual purchase price, an error in math, for example, the total does not add up, or an interest miscalculation. If you think there is an error on your bill, you should, within 60 days of receipt of your incorrect bill, notify your creditor in writing and keep a copy of the letter. You should always include your name, account number, and what you believe is the error. The lender is required to acknowledge your letter within 30 days. Within two billing cycles, no longer than 90 days, the lender must either correct the problem or explain why it believes the bill is correct. Resolving complaints by writing to the regulators. If you have written a letter to the bank that does not produce desired results, you can write to the bank's regulator for assistance. Sometimes that means writing to the FDIC. Like the complaint letter on the last page, include the following information to help the regulators investigate your complaint. Number one, state the problem briefly in a letter. Explain what occurred and how you would like to see the matter resolved. 2. Include your full name, address, and daytime and evening telephone numbers with area codes. Number 3. Provide the complete name and address of the financial institution along with the names of employees who have worked with you on the problem. 4. Include pertinent account information such as account numbers and the type of product you have. A checking account, savings account, home equity loan, or home loan. Number five, include important dates, such as the date a transaction took place or the date you contacted the financial institution about your problem. Six, send copies of documents that may help explain your problem. Keep the original documents. Seven, sign and date your letter. Additional lending laws. Service Members Civil Relief Act. The Service Members Civil Relief Act, SCRA, provides important legal rights to active duty military members and reservists or members of the National Guard called to active duty, and in limited situations, dependents of military members, for example, in certain eviction actions. The Act provides protection pertaining to civil judicial proceedings, residential rentals, mortgage loans, consumer loans, and credit card interest rates. For example, the interest rate on loans a service member received before entering active duty status is capped at 6% if the service member's military service materially affects his or her ability to pay. In addition, a service member on active duty may be able to successfully ask a court to postpone civil or administrative hearings that the service member is unable to attend due to his or her military duties. The Act also provides protection in the event of a foreclosure or repossession that occurs during active duty service. If you claim such eligibility under the SCRA, notify your creditors by phone and in writing, attach a copy of your orders, and visit your local military installation servicing legal office for assistance with any specific questions concerning your rights under the Act. Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act The Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act RESPA requires that lenders provide you with accurate and timely disclosures of the cost of settlement, such as loan organization fees, or points, broker's commissions, and title charges. RESPA was designed to prevent abusive practices such as kickbacks for loan referrals. Fair Housing Act The Fair Housing Act, FHA, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, familial status, including children under the age of 18 living with parents or legal custodians, pregnant women, and people securing custody of children under the age of 18, or handicap, disability, in housing-related transactions. Consumer Leasing Act The Consumer Leasing Act, CLA, requires clear disclosure of leasing terms so consumers can compare leases. Disclosures must be made before a lease is signed and must be available for the consumer to keep. Privacy Notices 
By law, lending institutions are required to provide you with privacy notices. These notices will explain how the institution shares your financial information with other companies or people. It will also explain in detail what information they collect from you. They are also required to tell you how you can limit the sharing of that information and what can be limited. Pay particular close attention to these notices as they can protect you from identity theft as well as other banking nightmares. There are several types of notices you may receive. 1. An initial notice when you first open an account. 2. An annual notice which would include any changes. 3. Notice of changes in the privacy policy. In some cases, you have the right to opt out of certain information sharing and participation. Typically, these opt-in or opt-out opportunities require you to do so within so many days, so make sure you are reading the privacy notices carefully when you get them, as they will explain the rules and the deadlines. This is very valuable information to understand and will alleviate headaches down the road. Predatory Lending Following are several indicators of possible predatory payday lending practices. 1. The company advertises terms that it does not actually offer. 2. You are not given disclosures listing terms such as the finance charge and APR. 3. There is no cooling off or waiting period between the time you repay a payday loan and the time you are allowed to obtain another loan. 4. You can get a payday loan even if you currently owe payday loans to other companies at the same time. 5. You can obtain as many payday loans as you want each year. 6. You can get a payday loan to finance unpaid interest and fees. 7. The company threatens to prosecute you criminally for writing a bad check even though it knew you had insufficient funds in your account to pay the check and you paid it a payday loan fee. Indicators of Predatory Mortgage Lending Excessive Fees Points and fees are costs not directly reflected in interest rates. Because these costs can be financed, they are easy to disguise or downplay. On predatory loans, fees totaling more than 5% of the loan amount are common. Abusive Prepayment Penalties Borrowers with higher interest subprime loans have a strong incentive to refinance as soon as their credit improves. However, most subprime mortgages carry a prepayment penalty, a fee for paying off a loan early. Be careful of prepayment penalties that last more than three years and or cost more than six months interest. Kickbacks to Brokers – Yield Spread Premiums When brokers deliver a loan with an inflated interest rate, for example, higher than the rate acceptable to the lender, the lender often pays the broker a fee known as a yield spread premium. This payment makes the loan more costly to the borrower. You can avoid this by shopping around for the best rate. Loan Flipping A lender flips a loan by refinancing it several times within a short time frame to generate fee income without providing any net tangible benefit to the borrower. Flipping can quickly drain borrower equity and increase monthly payments, sometimes on homes that had been previously owned free of debt. Unnecessary Products Sometimes borrowers may pay more than necessary because lenders sell and finance unnecessary insurance or other products along with the loan. Asset-Based Lending Predatory lenders may approve a loan based on the value of a customer's equity in the home instead of his or her ability to repay the loan. The lender may later encourage the customer to default so the lender can get ownership of the home. Steering and Targeting Predatory lenders may steer borrowers into subprime mortgages, even when the borrowers could qualify for a less expensive, typical loan. Vulnerable borrowers may face aggressive sales tactics and sometimes outright fraud. How to Avoid Predatory Mortgage Lenders Pay your bills on time to ensure you have a good credit history. Make sure your credit history is accurate by reviewing your credit report every year. Be an informed consumer. Make sure you shop around for the best deal. If a lender is unwilling to give you the information you need to comparison shop, you probably do not want to do business with him or her. Ask friends, family, and credit counselors for advice. Take someone along with you when you talk to a lender. Take your time before deciding on the best loan or lender. 
do not let lenders pressure you into a decision before you are ready. Be careful of lenders who tell you they do not care about your credit history or how much you earn. Many of these lenders charge higher interest rates and higher fees. Do not respond to advertisements that make lending sound cheap and easy. Be careful of offers to refinance your loan shortly after you just refinanced it. Make sure you really need the loan or the loan makes economic sense for you. Be careful of home improvement contractors that promise to get you a loan. Read and understand all documents before you sign them. Keep copies of what lenders give you. Most credit insurance is optional. Lenders cannot require you to purchase credit insurance from their company. There may be better alternatives to credit life insurance, such as a life insurance policy purchased separately. Ask if your mortgage has a balloon payment. Most or all of the loan amount is due on a specific date. If so, make sure the terms make sense for you. Ask if your mortgage has a mandatory arbitration clause. If so, understand what it means for you. If you think you are a victim of a predatory loan, contact your state's Consumer Protection Division or an attorney. Many communities have legal offices that provide free legal services called pro bono programs to individuals with limited income. To find a local program, look in the community services pages of your phone book or look in the white pages under legal services. What to do if your wallet or purse is lost or stolen? If your wallet or purse is lost or stolen, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, suggests that you file a report with the police as soon as possible. Keep a copy of the report in case your bank or insurance company needs proof of the crime. Cancel your credit cards immediately. Get new cards with different numbers. Place a fraud alert on your credit report by calling any of the major credit reporting agencies. You can call Equifax at 1-800-525-6285. TransUnion at 1-800-680-7289 and Experian at 1-888-397-3742. Report the loss to your bank. You might want to open new checking and savings accounts and stop payment on any lost checks. Contact the major check verification companies to request that they notify stores that use their databases not to accept these checks. You can also ask your bank to notify the check verification service with which it does business. Two of the check verification companies that accept reports of check fraud directly from consumers are Telecheck at 1-800-366-2425 and Certigy at 1-800-437-5120. Finally, get a new ATM card with a new number and password. Elder Financial Abuse what is elder financial abuse? Elder financial abuse is using an elder's money or assets contrary to the elder's wishes, needs, or best interests for the abuser's personal gain. Elder financial abuse covers a wide range of activities, including taking money or property, forging an older person's signature, getting an older person to sign a deed, will, or power of attorney through deception, coercion, or undue influence, using the older person's property or possessions without permission, promising lifelong care in exchange for money or property and not following through on the promise, committing confidence crimes or cons against older people, using deception to gain their confidence, scamming older people through the use of fraudulent or deceptive acts, committing fraud against older people through the use of deception, trickery, false pretense, or dishonest acts or statements for financial gain. Using telemarketing to commit scams against older people. Perpetrators call victims and use deception, scare tactics, or exaggerated claims to get them to send money. They may also make charges against victims' credit cards without authorization. Who are the perpetrators of elder financial abuse? Family members, including children, grandchildren, or spouses. They may have substance abuse, gambling, or financial problems, stand to inherit and feel justified in taking what they believe is almost or rightfully theirs, fear that their older family member will get sick and use up his or her savings, depriving the abuser of an inheritance, have had a negative relationship with the older person and feel a sense of entitlement.
have negative feelings towards siblings or other family members whom they want to prevent from acquiring or inheriting the older person's assets. Who is at risk? The following conditions or factors increase an older person's risk of being victimized. Isolation, loneliness, recent losses, physical or mental disabilities, lack of familiarity with financial matters, family members who are unemployed and or have substance abuse problems. How can elders be less of a target? Here are some lifestyle factors that will help you assess if an elder is at risk for financial abuse. Does the elder live alone? Does the elder still drive? If so, he or she may be prone to crashes or to being victimized by driving related scams. Does the elder spend a lot of time on foot in public places? If so, he or she may be targeted by exploiters who search for elderly victims at places such as banks, stores, parks, malls, and libraries. How many local friends does the elder have? Does the elder have information about housing options, care choices, and support groups? Have the elder's outside activities decreased over the past few years? Does the elder have family members in the area? Do they maintain weekly contact? Who regularly checks the status of the elder's bank accounts, charger credit accounts, or investments? Where and from whom is the elder getting financial and medical advice? Who oversees the elder's power of attorney? Does the elder seek advice of fortune tellers or psychic advisors? Does the elder know when and how to call the police for emergencies and non-emergencies such as a suspicious person? Hiring caregivers for your elders. How can I be more careful in employing caregivers? Consider these factors when employing caregivers. Is the caregiver hired from a reputable agency? Have the caregiver's references been checked? Has a criminal background check been done on the caregiver? Are the elder's checks, credit cards, etc. locked up? Is there a written service agreement signed by the caregiver and elder specifying duties and pay? Is there a log of workers, hours, and salary payments? And is there a weekly review of caregiver expenses? Lastly, Think about what could happen in the event of a disaster. Do you have adequate insurance against a flood or a hurricane? These are things that should be contemplated as a safety issue. What if a pipe bursts and ruins the inside of your home? Are you protected? What if there was a fire and you lost everything? What would it cost you to replace everything you own? Sometimes it is best to cover these types of losses with insurance to make sure the impact of a catastrophe is minimized.